John Orr, how you doing? Pretty good, Jason. How are you? I'm good. I appreciate you coming on this morning. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Thanks for uh, thanks for sending me a quick note to to join you. Yeah. So, uh, John, where where are you located? So, um, I'm over in Philadelphia. I'm actually in South Philadelphia, and I always like to recognize that my home sits on the ancestral land of the Lenni Lenape tribe. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just I'm kind of coming to you from my basement. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're with what institution? Uh, I'm with uh, ArtReach in uh, in Philadelphia, and, and ArtReach, I'm, I'm sure we'll dive into it, but we're an organization that believes that disability is a product of design rather than diagnosis, and that good design creates a more accessible world. So hmm. quite literally, all we have to do is change the world. <laughs> Redesign it. Yeah, exactly. People like us did it the first time. They just got it a little bit wrong. So it's, it's up to people like us to get, get the job done. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to get into ArtReach. How, um, have you always worked in, in arts and culture and in, in that uh, arena? Yeah, so my, um, my career started, it's funny, I was just talking to someone else about this. I think my, my career in the arts is now old enough to both drink and have a master's degree. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I started in 97, um, just in some frontline positions with uh, some bigger museums. I started off at the Franklin Institute I was there for a few years, um, ended up moving to the Academy of Natural Sciences, was there for a few years, went back to the Franklin because you know, they're only a block away from each other. Mm. Um, and somewhere in that transition, I was at the Academy of Natural Sciences and I remember I saw all these people funneling into a room and, um, and I asked them, I said, well, like, who are those people? Like, who, who are they? And someone said, oh, that's the board of directors. And now back then I was maybe 22. I had no idea what a board of directors was. And, uh, and I said, well, what, like, what does the board do? And they say, oh, they, they run the museums. And at the time, yeah. I was the museum services manager of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And I was like, no, like I run the museum. Like, how can they <laughs> run it if they've never talked to me or my team? What's sir, so real quick, what's, what's a service, services manager? A museum services manager basically is admissions, floor operations, making sure groups are where they are and behaving and, and all that stuff. Pretty much anything under the umbrella of the public's interaction with the museum okay. uh, kind of fell into my, into my realm. And, um, and it just kind of got stuck in my crawl that this, this organization had a board of people who were making decisions without talking to others. And um, I remember I left there eventually and I went to the Franklin and, and I was walking around and I was like, this place probably has a board too. One of those <laughs> boards. And uh, I don't know, I just, it got, I got fixated on it. And I thought if I ever run an organization, I'm gonna run it differently. And, um, and then I was like, well, like, screw it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go run one now. So I, I quit my job when I was 26 mm. um, to go be an executive director. And I quickly realized that I had no idea what a director did. Um, I didn't have a degree of any kind at, the, at that point, and I no longer had a job. So uh, I kind of was stuck for a little while. Wow. Um, ended up taking an executive assistant job at a small museum in Philadelphia, uh, the Masonic Library and Museum, and uh, learned from the front lines what it was like to work directly with an executive director. Hmm. Uh, from there, moved on to the Fleischer Art Memorial in South Philly, I worked with a great director there named Matt Braun, who um, really helped show me what a what a good director could do if they centered the community in their work. Mm. And, uh, you know, from there, I went on again to the Chemical Heritage Foundation, another science institution as the director in the president's office. And from there, I, I ended up at ArtReach. Mm. Wow, what a journey. So yeah. <laughs> did you grow up in Philly? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's... Uh, it's a point of pride. I think one of the reasons I've been able to be successful is because I love my city um, a lot. I grew up in the city. I live in South Philly now. Um, I have no real intention of leaving, although don't tell my partner that she'll, she'll be upset with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is my home and, and I don't think that I'd actually be able to bring the same level of passion that I bring to Philadelphia and my work here to another, to another city. Um, at least not not right away, not easily. Yeah. 
So those experiences at those institutions, um, well, let's get into our each a little bit first yeah. before, before we get into the, the other thing. Um, so art reach does a lot of different things mm -hmm. but let, let's hear it um yeah <laughs> so i mean you heard my my little spiel in the beginning about how we emphasize design as the pathway towards accessibility um at art reach we work really closely with the disability community to understand the barriers that they face um with arts organizations across the region and what we do is we we elevate their voice um, we, we, we used to say we co-created with the, with the disability community, but I think that's kind of an understatement of how we do our work. I think what we're really good at is transferring the power that we have from the position that we, that we hold in the city over to the disability community. So we give them, um, we empower them to, to bring their voices up and then to create actual change from the feedback that they, that they give us. The way that we do that kind of works in a cycle. Mm -hmm. So we partner with 200 arts organizations, 220 arts organizations across the across the region. Um, we listen to the disability community. We take their feedback. We then go and adapt programs at arts institutions that already exist, but just need a little bit of tweaking. Then we can build an audience for that arts organization from a network of human service agencies that we work with to go through the adaptive program. And then once that happens, we listen to the people who went through it and then we get their feedback and we readapt the program and then we build a new audience and it just kind of keeps going around in this cycle that, that allows us to make really quick advancements uh, while building new audiences for the arts. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the biggest sort of push of art reach. Um, and because we're so, we have so many connections with organizations, we can take on these really uh, really cumbersome, large-scale collaborations in Philadelphia that that really drive the sector forward. Um, I mean, when I came into Art Reach, we weren't we weren't really nationally known. We were serving about thirteen thousand people a year. Mm -hmm. um, but since since we've sort of recentered the community at the core of our work, we've seen all of that kind of change. Right. So now we serve over two hundred thousand people a year. We uh, are known nationally. We host an international conference every year on, on arts accessibility. And it's really just because we've taken the position of privilege that we hold as an organization, and we've used that position of privilege to empower others to make change um, in Philadelphia. It, when you, as you're speaking, um, it seems to be that this is a model that can be applied for arts and culture and history institutions even if their it focus isn't accessibility and disability they could do that for any type of outreach or programming or that yes. that cycle that you're talking about yeah i mean the the approach that i applied at art reach was one that i learned directly during my time at the fleischer art memorial we um at, when i was at, at fleischer we were trying to engage uh, new immigrant and new refugee communities in Southeast Philadelphia. And we centered them at the core of the program expansion. Um, and it, it had so much, so much more impact turning power over to the community uh, that moved Fleischer forward. And so when I saw the impact there, I thought, okay, so let's, when I go to Art Reach, like, let's, let me take the lessons learned from that previous experience and push them forward into ArtReach and see what happens. Um, there was a time at ArtReach where our finances weren't weren't great, and you know, I, I I literally went into it thinking, well, if if nothing happens, we're probably going to be gone in four years anyway. So, you know, I'll I'll embody the Philadelphia spirit of you know we'll go down swinging, <laughs> um, we'll take a shot and. Uh, and see what happens. And, and we just changed our approach. We kind of really scaled down our operations to focus on what we were really good at. And then we leaned into it really, really intentionally. And, you know, the result was that we experienced a lot more success going forward. And so we've stabilized the finances, we've grown the programming, and we've become, you know, a, a resource for people across the country. Um, and even a little bit beyond the country. Uh, 
mm -hmm. on on some best practices and arts accessible arts engagement. What what were what was if you can if you can get in the specifics? What were some of the things that you said? You know that just needs to die on the vine. We're going to cut that, and we got to focus. What are some of the things you said? We got to focus on these things, and we got to let those things go. Can you yeah. give some of those examples? So we, um, when I came to Artreach, I used to have a list, and it's not near me right now. But uh, when I came to Artreach, there were about thirteen independent programs that were running, and it, for me, I only had a staff of six at the time, including me, right? So that, it wasn't that the programs were bad, right? The, mm -hmm. the, it, what, we didn't have a program problem. We had, <laughs> we had a math problem, right? We had too many programs and too few people to run them. Like a so restaurant we, that has too much stuff on a menu. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And you just sit there staring at it for a while. And then you uh, wonder why the food do. isn't coming out and why right. it's cold and they're like, well, because you got 5,000 <laughs> things on there. You're doing right. oysters and Thai food. Yeah, so we were, our focus was split. And so when I came in, we basically got rid of two thirds of the programs ArtReach talked about. Um, we didn't get really rid of, of all the work. We just kind of organized them in a way that was much simpler to communicate and it fit into a single narrative. So we ended up with four core programs, we called them. Mm -hmm. um, and one was the program we were founded on. It's, you know, distributing discount tickets. <clears throat> One was kind of the idea of what goes, what's the next step beyond just giving someone a free ticket? And that's what we, we, um, we launched this program called Encore, which was all about program adaptation uh, with some of our partners. And that was a little small program. We had this little budding program called Access Philly that uh, was started just before I got there. And I... We, we all kind of identified pretty quickly that that was going to be a, a huge potential program, um, but it was just getting started. And then we had education and learning, right? So we, we wanted to lean into what are we doing for the sector? How are we bringing together the arts organizations, the disability community and the human service networks to have a, a, like an all-inclusive cross-sector dialogue? So those were the four that we wanted to keep. Um, the ones that we let go, there were, you know, we had this equipment rental program that we had inherited. And what it was, was it was captioning equipment and uh, audio description equipment mm. that we were basically, we held the equipment and we were like renting it out to all these different theaters. <laughs> and it was so time consuming and cumbersome, right? Yeah. So instead of, and I stepped back and I was like, look, we, we can't, like one, we don't even know if this equipment works. Uh, we don't know how long it'll work. This is this is kind of bonkers, but um, so instead, what we what I ended up doing early in 2015 was I I contacted all the companies that we got that or not that 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 equipment originally came from. We got it from another organization, but hmm. um, we contacted the uh, the companies that that sold it to that organization, and I just said, look, I've got nine theaters in the city of Philadelphia who all use this equipment can I broker a deal between you and those nine theaters so that they can all get discount equipment um, and we can just put this into all these theaters all at once so that I'm not juggling this like rental program and those theaters can provide on-demand services. Mm. And so for me, it was like, I'll spend a week brokering that deal um, just to get the year's worth of work off my team's plate. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And we, uh, we broke a deal, a bunch of places bought their own equipment. And then the ones that couldn't, there was a handful left over. We just gave them our equipment. We just said, here you go. Now you've got it, it's free. It's not gonna last forever. You should upgrade at some point, but until you do, you know, you've got a set that works now. It's just like little things like that. Yeah. So when, it, when ArtReach approaches an organization or now maybe an organization approaches ArtReach, <laughs> um, is it, help me understand, is it, is an institution sort of just, they're just, they're in the, they're in the grinder, they're just doing their thing. And it's like, they need that, that coach, that boost from, from your organization to, to get them going. So I think there's a few different ways, right? We have a really low entry point for any arts organization. I mean, basically if, if, if you want us to help get the, the disability community 
uh, into your organization, you can, you can donate us tickets and we will work with the human service network that we have to distribute all those tickets. Hmm. Um, to kind of put that in perspective, when we started, when I came in in 2015, we were coming off a year where we gathered about $169,000 worth of free admission tickets. Um, in the last full program year, 2019, that number was $733,000 worth of, of free stuff. So, and that's not just inflation, that's just a couple of years. We just started gathering a lot more, um, a lot more you know, opportunities to offer to people. Uh, so that's kind of the lowest bar, right? But once you get the, the audience in, and this is what I love about ArtReach's programs and how we build it. Once you get the, the disability community in, we wanna make sure that you're prepared to welcome them. So we have trainings and all these other pieces where we can bring in um, members of the disability community or members of staff um, who have lived experience, who can teach disability etiquette, uh, talk about language, talk about, you know, the, the history of the disability rights movement, um, and just kind of give a baseline perspective um, as, a, as a training for the entire staff of an organization. From there, we have, you know, we'll do a full audit of your organization, we'll do an assessment, we'll do program adaptation, and we'll help you create more accessible programming but that's, that first training is kind of the, the, the baseline. And then if, you, if neither one of them are, are programs that you wanna get involved with, um, the Access Philly program is probably the next easiest level of, of entry. So right now, well, right now we have 54 organizations in greater Philadelphia. I don't know when this will air, but uh, we have a, a program expansion happening in, in the summertime that'll add another 12 organizations to it. Um, but there's, you know, so in total, there's about 66 organizations that are all using the public assistance cards from the state of Pennsylvania to provide $2 admission to um, people with disabilities and people who uh, need assistance for food benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and that cuts across museums and theaters. So instead of being part of our ticketing program where you're just distributing a, an allotment of free tickets to us, we're saying be a part of this program, you capture the revenue and keep it that, that's generated from it. Um, but you, in return, you provide no blackout dates for people to access these, to access your institution. And, um, you know, I, I, we have different people who choose different paths and every path is fine. Um, I think what's, what's beneficial for us is that we can be the, the person who provides you the resources we can build you the audience and then we can kind of, I don't want to say hold your hand as you get more comfortable in the process, but we're there as a resource for you. Um, not only to, to make sure that you know what you're doing, but also to hold you accountable, right? I think a lot of these programs, they get started and then you know the, the catalyst organization goes away and does something else. Right. Um, and then they slowly dissipate into nothing. Yeah. I think what I'm proud of is that we're able to hold the sector accountable and there, therefore the, the sector continues to, to push the envelope a little bit. How are you finding the smaller and mid-size institutions? How are they faring with, with partnering with ArtReach or not? Or, you know, what are some yeah. of the, what are their challenges? What is, what's the SWOT analysis for those places? You yeah. Know? So it's funny. I think the, the, um, the smaller and mid-range places are a little bit easier to work with uh, just because they're more nimble um, and they're a little bit, right? In a lot of ways, they're like art reach. We're so small and we fly under the radar for so many, so many like big funders and, and other things mm. that we can take a risk and completely fail and just get up, dust ourselves off. And it's, it's like no big deal. We just keep moving forward. Mm. Um, I think for some of the smaller mid-sized organizations, they kind of have that same scrappy mentality where they're like, yeah, we, we would love to do this. We don't have a ton of money. We understand that. So we, we come in and we provide the resources that we can. Mm. Um, I think it's when we get to the bigger organizations, right? That you hit that, you hit this level of bureaucracy that's, that's tough to get accessibility to, to bubble up to the top layers of that organization from a strategy perspective. Whereas with the smaller mid-range organizations, like I can generally reach out to, I mean, I, 
I feel comfortable reaching out to any ED or president of, of a cultural organization, but the likelihood of, of outreach's leadership getting in front of the leadership of small and mid-range organizations and convincing them of the, the sort of theory behind why we do the work that we do is way higher than us getting into, you know, the big giant organizations uh, yeah. that, that we have in the city. Yeah. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about um, STAMP? Oh yeah, that's our uh, <laughs> that's our um, our newest program that we that we took over. Uh, so Stamp was um, all credit due to to the Cultural Alliance of Greater Philadelphia. They they started Stamp in 2014, I think it was. And basically, the idea was how do we get high school students to engage with museums in Philadelphia? And so Stamp stands for Students at Museums in Philly. Uh, provides free admission to any, any high school student in the, in the city. Um, we found out in June of 2020 that GPCA was discontinuing the program. Okay. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons they made that decision. There, there's a, you know, a leadership transition that they're going through right now. And I think that, that you know, they might be at a point that ArtReach was at in 2015, where we were kind of looking at where we should invest our resources. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, they they dropped the program, and as soon as that happened, I was like, "Pick it up!" Oh, it like it like hit me in the gut so hard. I was just like, "Wait a second! Like we're in the middle of a year where school funding, especially arts funding in schools, uh, has just been decimated. It's going to continue to be decimated. The likelihood of field trips to museums is going to be so much lower post COVID, um, and and was already on the decline anyway." It just it felt like a natural fit for us to pick that program up since we're used to these big collaborations. So we stepped in. Um, we worked at the Cultural Alliance on a on a transition plan. We got a little bit of seed funding to um, keep it going from the Kimmel Family uh, Kimmel Family Fund, and yeah, we've been kind of off and running. I think what's interesting with it is that we. We again, we like went back and simplified it a little bit. <clears throat> hmm. We, uh, I think the program used to run with a with an app on a phone, and um, we kind of just were like, we're not going to pay for the app. We're not going to waste money on that technology. Every high school student in Philadelphia gets a student ID. That can be the identifier. And if they use that identifier at all these museums, we can collect real-time admission data on what's happening at all of the sites. And so that was the baseline. We were like, okay, we'll run it a little bit more efficiently. But the big piece to it is how do we take high school students in Philly um, and use the, the, the STAMP program as a way for high school students to bolster college applications and support curriculum ideas um, in their education so that we can better position students to kind of support their college applications in a much more dynamic way than has been done in the past. Mm. And, um, and what does it mean when we can step back and say, okay, we've got a network of places that are welcoming teens, or at least saying that they're welcoming teens. What does it look like to start setting up, you know, teen lounges uh, either during the school day or after the school day at all of these different institutions and creating all these different entry points for uh, for teens to engage with the arts. So I'm, I'm super jazzed about it. I can't, I can't wait for it to get off the ground and, and hmm. really kind of get moving. Yeah, that's, that's cool. It, um, if, if you don't mind, maybe we could chat a little bit about um, the, obviously behind the scenes, there's gotta be a lot of, there's fundraising involved with the organization and the growth of outreach over the years. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your fundraising activities uh, over the years <laughs> and how it, how um, it evolved? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we're pretty stubborn. Um, <laughs> we try to, we try to make as much of our programming and much of, as much of our uh, fundraising unrestricted as possible. Um, in order to do that, we um, 
I focus a lot of my effort on, on individual giving. Uh, we've had a big increase in individual giving over the years. We, whenever we go for restricted funding, we do so with the idea that it will offset earned revenue that would be paying for that organ or for that for that program, um, so that we can redeploy the earned revenue somewhere else. Essentially, making a restricted grant unrestricted um, in its impact. Mm. And you know, we, I, I don't know. You and I have talked about this before <laughs> at yeah. the SMA conference. I think I tried to keep it really simple, right? So. Obviously, if it's a foundation application, I go through a, you know, whatever they want from me, we, we will fill out and we'll get to them. But if it's an individual proposal, I like to get kind of straight to the point of why we're doing what we want to do. Um, Philadelphia is the proportionately the most disabled major city in the entire country. We have the highest rate of poverty among major cities in the country. We're one of the most violent cities. Um, but there's a lot of ways that we can work through the arts to solve a lot of those issues or to address a lot of those issues by centering the community. And so for me, it's the, the fundraising approach that we take is very based in storytelling, like I think a lot of places are, but it's also, you know, we have the benefit of being able to say, this is the issue. We've identified a, a method to addressing it. And then we can produce the results on a sector level uh, that indicate we're moving the needle. And so I just try to be as clear and concise and, you know, if my individual proposals are, are all about a page and a half long, yeah. um, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of the fluff. If people want to hear that, we can have a conversation about it. Um, but I try to get straight to the point. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a really missed um, point for a lot of folks is that they, that, that the proposals, the asks, the communications are, are, way too complicated. Yeah. And it's almost like, I forget the term where you've, you've already made, don't, don't sell yourself out of a deal, you know, kind of. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, the, a lot of the funders that um, I've worked with family foundations, individuals, we forget they're real people. They're, <laughs> they got lives, they're busy. You yep. know, sometimes it's, you know, stop with all the fluff. Let's go have coffee. What do you need? How much do you need? And right. yeah. shoot me straight. Shoot me straight. That's yeah. what people want. Yeah. Well, and I think it's it's important, right? And I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shortchange like what we like. We work our butt off for right. for for every dollar, right? And we try to put every dollar to the best possible use that we can raise. Um, in fact, I remember back in, in 2016, when we were kind of going through that financial turnaround, one of the big keys to it was outsourcing all of our finance work, um, all of our accounting work to a, to a third party firm so that I could focus more on individual giving. And that's when we saw this shift. We, our individual giving, giving grew by, um, by over 300%. And mm -hmm. so that was, that was great. But we also realized really quickly that a few things had to happen. One, we had to have a strategy that made sense so that when we talked to people, we were like, no, this is what we want to do. These are the steps to get there, but this is all serving a, a much bigger vision um, down the road. And, um, and I think we're, we've stayed on that path and we're in a good spot for it. The, um, the other part of it was that we wanted to personally connect our stories to the funders that we had, right? So we wanted to be able to say, you know, I don't even know how to, how to put it, um, <laughs> but uh, everybody has a personal connection somewhere to disability. Mm -hmm. um, everybody knows how to internalize the feeling um, that, of, of someone being left out, right? And, and being able to, to quickly build with a funder the feeling of empathy um, is really important to everything that we do. And I think we're able to do that so well because we work so closely with the community mm. and elevate their stories. Instead of, instead of speaking for the community, we let the community speak for, for themselves. Um, and it's, it's been a really powerful 
powerful turnaround for us in Philly. Yeah. So uh, before we get to the lightning round, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> I got I, I gotta. This is a big question, but um, where, where, how is, where is ArtReach going? The I'd say the big idea of ArtReach, the concept, mm -hmm. maybe even the organization. Where is it going in in other cities? Where, where's, how is this model? Are you seeing it being uh, popping up in? you know, sister and brother organizations in other cities. <laughs> um, and what are you, what are you doing to make that happen, John Orr? Yeah. So it's funny because I'm like mired in this conversation right now. Uh, I think whenever we go and present at a conference or we go somewhere, the, the number one thing we hear all the time is, oh, we need an art reach in our city. Yeah. We need you guys in our city. And I, and you know, it's, for me, it goes back to what we talked about earlier in, in this in this call. Um, you know, we're we're a very Philly centric organization, and right now, my organization and I will openly admit we're grappling with this. You know, what does a national strategy for art reach look like? And it's part of our strategic planning. We're in the middle of the, literally in the middle of the conversation right now, um, hmm. and. The idea is like there are different ways to be national, right? So we could create like a chapter program and start opening up art reaches all over the place, right? But I think for me as a director during my time at ArtReach, instead of doing that, I'd rather just be known nationally for the work that we're doing locally. Um, and I know that I can't go into another city and build the relationships that ArtReach has built over the last 35 years um, overnight. And I can't bring the same level of enthusiasm and passion into another city like I do in Philadelphia. And so for me, it's like, why would I move, why would I move on from this city if I know that the job here isn't done? Right. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, we've got to figure that out. We've got to figure out how we can showcase the model that we've built in Philly for other people in other cities to take on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's a it's a question we're grappling with right now. <laughs> so if there was a little organization in Baltimore, for example, or yeah. or I don't know, in some city, and they hear what they hear about art reach and they and they attend the conference and they, they're so inspired and they their little organization, they come together and they're called Arts for All. And they mm -hmm. start to build and they start to do the amazing things in their city that art reach has been able to do in some ways um, that's just as good or better than creating, you know, art reach Cincinnati or whatever, because right, they, yeah. it, it's personalized for their city. So yeah. Like uh, I will say that um, just because you brought this one phrase up, the arts for all phrase, I'm going to, I'm just going to oh, put like I, I just made it up. on. I know, I know, but everybody uses it. It's funny. Oh, um, really? I never even heard of it. <laughs> oh yeah so um i got into a conversation with another organization about an or a program they wanted to call arts for all earlier in 2020 really? and the feedback that we that we got it was all about accessibility and um the feedback that we got from the disability community tangentially it was it was in another conversation um was that organizations that use the phrase arts for all uh okay. to describe their accessible programming um are, are ignoring the specific needs that the disability community has, right? You're not naming the community. And in fact, um, some members uh, of the conversation likened the idea of arts for all with all lives matter, right? If you say all lives matter, you're, you're, you're leaving out the fact that um, there are specific issues that, that affect the black community in much different ways, right? And that's why there's this negative connotation to all lives matter. Um, same with the disability community. If you say arts for all, you're still ignoring the, mm -hmm. the, the, the specific barriers that the disability community faces in arts engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, that, yeah. that's one, I'll just put my, take my advocacy hat back off now. Um, I, I'm but, glad I accidentally like brought that I have never I swear I'd never heard that <laughs> I just yeah, make it up on this zoom yeah yeah well the problem is a lot of people just make it up and they always come up with that one and we're like 
damn it, man, no, just say it's accessible programming. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think for for any other city that wants to get started, I mean, I don't know. I'm having a conversation on Thursday uh, with ArtReach's founder, and you know, she started the organization back in '86, four years before the ADA was even a thing, hmm. and um, you know, she just did it. Like she didn't worry about about you know how to do it she just said i'm gonna do it she was a choreographer who was tired of seeing empty theaters so she started asking her friends for free tickets and giving them out to people who didn't have access yeah and you know i think i think at some point some organizations just have to take a or, or people people just have to take a step um and i think if you care enough about your city and like your area then you're the right person to make to make that step happen. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think anyone who who wants to get it started, I'm, obviously I'm happy to talk to anybody about, about, you know, to calm any nerves, but they, uh, they should just go out and make it happen. Yeah. Can you, can you plug the conference before we do the lightning round? Oh yeah. For the, for the art reach. Yeah. So our art reach conference is, September 21st through the 22nd, no, I'm sorry, September 21st through the 23rd of 2021. The whole thing is virtual. Uh, it'll all be captioned. Um, it'll all be ASL interpreted. And it's a three-day conference. It's about half-day sessions um, or multiple sessions over the course of a half a day. And uh, the entire conference is about a hundred bucks uh, to go to. Mm -hmm. I think if you go to ArtReach, or art-reach.org slash conference. You'll see uh, more information about it. And um, yeah, it's, it's fun. We're pulling in proposals from all over the world. Last year, we had about 250 attendees from 10 different countries. Uh, so it's, you know, it's fun. It's again, it's, it's you know, using the leverage that we can within the, the accessibility in the arts community um, to just help people learn a little more. In the video, I'll put the um, the website stuff and information about it. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. All right. So you ready? This is some tough questions. Okay. This is okay. So I'll just be like frozen for a minute as I think about all the lightning round answers. You know, <laughs> I'll pretend like my Zoom froze. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The first one. You've got to pick. You can't have both. Sushi or a cheesesteak? A oh, cheesesteak. 100% <laughs> every time. <laughs> <laughs> um uh water slide or roller coaster oh roller coaster yeah yeah okay Are you just trying to get me to say the word water <laughs> water <laughs> water two o's and a d yeah well, I'm, from, <laughs> I'm from baltimore so i know what it's like to say water <laughs> <laughs> um and then number three fancy socks or fancy ties Oh, you know, the real colorful ones with the, yeah, I'll go socks on this one. Although yeah. I love a good tie, man. I, you know what? I'll go socks because I never wear a tie anymore anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems like you get more compliments on fancy socks than you do a fancy tie. Huh? I think so. Yeah. I think it's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, John, this has been a this has been a lot of fun, and um, thank you for your time and for sharing sharing your story and um, how how you've grown, how you and your team have grown ArtReach over the years, and it's going to be cool to see what happens over the next few years. Yeah, we're we're trying. Yeah, keep moving forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Jason. All right, take care. Bye.